So it's time to start. And we're starting halfway down page 156 today. <clears throat> and uh, I might just refer back to the list of qualities that was discussed first, because this is about now what to do about these things. And I was just scanning through during my first half of the glass of carrot juice and found <laughs> before the rest went on the floor and found that um, it's quite interesting because first the Buddha's sort of diagnosing the problems and then he's going through three more phases. And the first one is like a reasoned reflection. So we reflect on the problems inherent in these uh, particular um, unwholesome states of mind. And then the next bit, which we'll come to, is that we review ourselves and we actually investigate ourselves to see if they're there or not. And the last part is that we do something to remedy them if they are there. So it's three R's, reflection or reasoned reflection, review and remedy. So maybe you can remember that. Yeah. So the qualities last week that we discussed were things that make us um, difficult to correct and I'll just run through it again. And uh, note that in these suttas, wherever it refers to a monk, it's really referring to monastics in general and anybody practicing uh, meditation. It would apply to everybody equally. In this context, it's um, particular things that we should look out for in the Sangha, in the monastic Sangha, because we are trying to live in community and in harmony. And so these particular um qualities or lack of qualities of mind will have an impact on those that we live around. And of course, that's the same in any family or workplace, but particularly so when you're actually um, trying to practice together, it's so essential that we have harmony, a feeling of safety and trust, like we did at the barn last week on the Meta Retreat. You know, it was very beautiful and intimate and how um, inspiring was it really to find that we could create a sense of genuine community where we could show up just as we were within seven days. And by the seventh day, I mean, we were family. You know, it wasn't just within seven days. It was kind of there very early on um, because of probably a lot to do with everyone that had gone before and the fact we were cultivating beautiful states of mind. So this is what makes someone difficult to correct. And I'll just recap. So here, a person has evil desires and is dominated by evil desires. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. Number two, one lords themselves and disparages others. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. Three, a person is angry and overcome by anger. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. So this is already stating the importance of being able to receive feedback, especially constructive feedback. And there are many, many guidances of the Buddha to explain how to give feedback in a constructive way. So it's both ways. <clears throat> so I'll just run through the qualities without um, the refrain. So every single quality here is something that makes one difficult to correct. So number four, someone is angry and resentful because of anger. Number five, angry and stubborn because of anger. Number six, angry and utters words bordering on anger. And when reproved, they resist the reprover. Number eight, when reproved, they denigrate the reprover. Have you ever experienced this? <laughs> uh, number nine, when reproved, they counter reprove the reprover. <laughs> People in the room are nodding. When reproved, they prevaricate, lead the talk aside and show anger, hate and bitterness. Number 11, when reproved, they fail to account for their conduct. Number 12, one is contemptuous and insolent. 13, envious and miserly. 14, fraudulent and deceitful. 15, obstinate and arrogant. And number 16, and possibly the most destructive or one of the most destructive and um, difficult to shift, let's say, is that one adheres to their own view holds to them tenaciously and relinquishes them with difficulty. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. So that's a little recap. And it's isn't it a bit reassuring to know that even the monks and nuns in, well, actually it only says the monks, <laughs> <laughs> in the Buddha's day were, uh, you know, displaying these kind of um, 
qualities or lack of, <laughs> which could be destructive, which could be, um, you know, very uh, um, disharmonious, disagreeable to their fellow monks or nuns. And also, of course, to the lay people too, they wouldn't have a lot of faith in a Sangha like that. So people are people in all times and ages and, and places, you know, wherever you go in the world, we're all subject to these qualities. And that's why it resonates, isn't it? Like we hear this and we think, oh, I know that. I know how that feels. I know other people who I can identify as doing that sometimes. And perhaps sometimes, if we're really honest, we can see these in ourselves. So um, the next thing is that the Buddha goes through what we do about this. So this is where we start fresh today. Now, friends, I'll say a person, because obviously most of us aren't monks. In fact, none of us are. A person. A person ought to infer about themselves in the following way. Number one, a person with evil desires and dominated by evil desires is displeasing and disagreeable to me. If I were to have evil desires and be dominated by evil desires, I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. A person who knows this should arouse in their mind, I shall not have evil desires and be dominated by evil desires. So this is great, isn't it? Because it's so easy to project the blame outside and not to see it, you know, the real problem there, to blame the other, to generate hate and contempt for the other. But actually, we can also see, OK, this is actually uh, disagreeable and displeasing. What if I can take it as a lesson not to do the same? So I always feel we can learn even from... Uh, you know, the difficult situations, the difficult people in our lives by realising what is conducive to harmony and to the greater good and what is not, instead of just kind of getting angry and upset about it. Yeah, we can take that as a lesson for ourselves. So that's the first quality. And here it does skip over a lot of them. But the next one is uh, the person who lords themselves and disparages others. So again, one who loves themselves and disparages others is this pleasing and disagreeable to me. If I were to lord myself and disparage others, I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. Someone who knows this should arouse in their mind, I should not lord myself and disparage others. And it goes like this all the way through. So somebody who is angry, resentful, stubborn because of that anger, utters angry words, etc., is disagreeable and displeasing to me. Therefore, if I do the same, I will be disagreeable and displeasing to others. And it carries on in the same way about reproving. When reproved, one uh, resists the reprover, denigrates the reprover, counter-reproves the reprover, prevaricates, leads the talk aside, shows anger, hate and bitterness, fails to account for their conduct. That is displeasing and disagreeable to me. Therefore, if I were to react in these ways when I'm reproved, I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. Someone who knows this should arouse their mind thus. And this is where wise thinking, wise thought and reflection can come in. I shall not be difficult to reprove, etc. But I shall be link I shall be easy to reprove, I guess is the opposite there. And it carries on in this way. So the last one here is the view, as we said before. So I'll read through the view. Uh, because that one's given in full here somewhere. <clears throat> if I were to adhere to my views. Hold on to them tenaciously and relinquish them with difficulty. I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. Right? You're not easy to talk to when you can't see another person's point of view. Someone who knows this should arouse their mind thus. I shall not adhere to my own views. Hold on to them tenaciously, but I shall relinquish them easily. So this is the review section, isn't it? And then, further than this, we go on to the next part. Now, friends, a person should review themselves thus. 
Do I have evil desires and am I dominated by evil desires? So back to the first quality again. If when they review themselves, they know I have evil desires, I am dominated by evil desires, then they should make an effort to abandon those evil unwholesome qualities. But if when they review, they know I have no evil desires, I'm not dominated by evil desires, then do you just go fine, no problem, carry on? No, then you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome qualities. <laughs> So this is the part where I was saying, you know, the first part was like the, um, how did I say it? The, the reflection, right? If somebody does those things, I don't like it. So therefore I shouldn't do those things. And this part is the review, the honest investigation. Do I actually have these things? Because it's not enough just to know that having them would harm another. We actually have to then start going inside and having a look. Yeah, we already have a sense of right view in the first part by this reasoned reflection. You know, knowing what is wholesome and unwholesome and how it causes suffering. The Buddhist teachings always circle around suffering and um, what leads to it and what leads to freedom from suffering. And then we have to actually have that courage to go inside and review ourselves. And I think this is what's so different, isn't it, about the Buddhist teachings. It's not just a list of what we should or shouldn't do. It's actually asking us to have a look inside and um, and be honest to ourselves. And I often think this uh you know, people often feel a sense of safety and trust around meditators. Why? Is it because we're better people? Quite often, we're just the same as everybody else, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> Even those people you think have evil desires. I mean, we are capable of that as well. Or at least, you know, desires, it says evil, but it really, again, means things that lead to suffering and, you know, destruction and and all kinds of things. I mean, for example, cheating on a partner, right? You might think you have great, great reasons for that. And, you know, you just can't help yourself. You're only human. But goodness me, that's going to create a lot of suffering. So, um, but I always think that the difference between someone practicing and someone not is more the willingness to take responsibility, you know, to actually go inside and be honest to what's happening and stop blaming outside conditions. Of course, we have to understand that outside conditions could be supportive or less supportive, but really the, the remedy can only lie inside by investigating the source and knowing also what to do with these things. So part of right view also is knowing the qualities that are wholesome and the qualities that are not and understanding what to do with them is the next step. So am I... Uh, what will the next one be? So do I lord myself and disparage others? <laughs> if we review ourselves and see I do lord myself and disparage others, and of course this is not all the time because there's no permanent self in there that's going to be doing this every moment, but at that moment, is that what we're up to? Then we should make an effort. So we have to be honest. Yes, okay, that's happening. Then we make an effort to abandon those qualities Evil, unwholesome qualities. Evil is a bit of a loaded word, but it's actually primarily prefers bad. But I just think it's kind of um, afflictive in the sense it creates suffering. Unwholesome is also good enough on its own, I think. But if when we review ourselves, we know we do not lord ourselves and disparage others, most of the time we take it for granted, don't we? But here you've got an opportunity. It says we can abide happy and glad training day and night in wholesome qualities. So recognize those things are absent and actually feel good about that, feel a sense of happiness. And again, it's not like I'm so great. It's more, isn't the mind nice? Isn't, you know, don't I feel um, calm and at peace with myself when those things are absent? And when we recognize that, we can actually tap into a sense of joy and gladness and a sense that we are on the right track in life. And then not take that for granted either, recognizing that these things can still come up. We can train ourselves in wholesome qualities. And in a sense, that's what we were doing in the meta retreat. We were constantly trying to, you know, incline to training in wholesome states. And just by doing that, you know, it makes it much, much less likely that these other things are going to creep back in. 
Yeah. In fact, it's really impossible when you're actually having thoughts of loving kindness, feelings of loving kindness at that time anyway, unless the mindfulness slips, it's not possible to have evil desires. Yeah. The mind is motivated by loving kindness and hopefully a loving kindness that's based on wisdom there. Okay, well, I'm wondering if we should pause for any questions or comments at this stage, because um, it carries on much the same way. It's basically reviewing ourselves in all these ways and checking, do we have these things? When we prove, do we prevaricate and leave the talk aside? Do we sometimes? Or are we doing now? You know, what if I said to you, oh, excuse me, you're not supposed to be lying down in this talk. <laughs> so, oh, but you said... <laughs> We should relax. <laughs> well, that's kind of uh, just arguing, isn't it? So do we do these things? I'd be curious to know. And I'd also be really curious to hear from anyone if they do ever notice when on Holston State so absent and feel good about that. I'd be very curious to hear from you. Yeah, sure. If you speak up a little bit. Um, she's just asking. She's going to speak up and hopefully the mic will pick it up. I don't quite understand what to load oneself is. Yeah. And uh, uh, disparage sounds like to criticize mm. others, but I don't understand the word load. Load, yeah. It's L A U D. And it basically means to kind of um, praise yourself and put other people down. So to kind of elevate yourself. I wouldn't do that. I'm better than that. You know, that person does it. They really shouldn't. I mean, I stopped doing that years ago. <laughs> it's to kind of compare yourself in a positive way with someone else, which it's almost, I think, sometimes we get a sense of self through comparing and, and pitching ourselves above other people. And it gives us a sense of, okay, I'm doing all right. But it's actually not, a very skillful way to reflect because we're all so different and everybody's conditions are different and what if we were in their shoes we might have those same qualities and I think furthermore we don't even really know another person you know we can think that they're motivated by so-called evil desires but how do we really know so it's that habit that I think all human beings have really to kind of uh try and pitch themselves above certain other people to make ourselves feel better somehow. And it probably largely stems from a sense of low self-esteem. Yeah. To praise yourself yeah. on its own is fine. Is it not? Uh, Sorry? Like if you just compliment yourself, oh, I did a good job today. Yeah, that's okay. I think that's fine, like to actually... Um, to encourage ourselves with praise, because here it says, you know, recognize that there are wholesome qualities and be glad about that. But that's not disparaging anyone else. That's looking inside. That's not saying, well, I've got, a, you know, a lot of generosity, but they're really stingy. Then that kind of undermines your own generosity. You know, mm -hmm. if you're only generous for the sake of, you know, inflating the ego, then it's not real generosity. Real generosity is just a beautiful giving and you're not comparing with anyone else. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but it sounds quite difficult actually not to. Uh... Isn't it? Yeah, if we're honest, I think it is difficult. I don't know what others think. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're quite, maybe because we grow up in fairly competitive societies that do pitch us out, pitch one person against the next, you know. From young age at school, there's competitions, aren't there, even among like four-year-olds, the egg and spoon race or whatever. Yeah, it's quite difficult to do that in the work environment as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have to be really, really skillful in that way. Mm. Yeah. Do you hear the comment about the skill needed in the workplace? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have some examples of skillful ways to? Well, you have to. You know, talk about the other people as well because so that is the way it is being done. So you can't just mm -hmm. and uh, so you, maybe you just I'll try to tell things like very neutrally as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and then then you go on rather than putting somebody yeah. down. So, but then you need to select your words very carefully. But sometimes I tell something thinking that I told neutrally, but then I think I say maybe. 
you know, that would have, you know, other yeah. person might have got affected in that way. Yeah, so yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. But yeah. as long as we're honest to it, I guess that's where we learn. One thing that comes to mind while you're speaking, I, I hope you heard all of that. It's really valuable input. Um, is one of Adrian Brown's advices, which is to always um, criticise the behaviour, but not the person. Mm. And I think there's a very different motive there. You know, it's actually more aligned to wisdom, isn't it? Noticing, like it says in the sutta, mm. doing this is displeasing. And and uh, what was the other word? Displeasing and disagreeable. You know, you could even say that to somebody, that this behaviour is disagreeable or it creates suffering, it creates conflict, it creates problems for people in the office or whatever. But you praise, you don't actually pull that person down. It's mm. it's a different motivation, I think. Yeah. And this is why, you know, the, the Buddha's advice on how to give feedback is so important, that it has to be the right time, it has to be done for the benefit of all parties, with a mind of metta. I think here, you know, when you're lauding some yourself and disparaging others, it's with a mind of conceit. Mm. It's not with a mind of loving kindness. You know, it's a kind of, it's a pride. It's coming from a sense of self. Probably quite a wounded sense of self that needs to put others down to feel good. So I think a lot of that is in the motivation. And maybe that's where we have to be really careful. You know, to, Because we can't avoid upsetting people. That's not realistic. And that would mean we can never say anything to anyone. And the Buddha did say we should... Um, dispraise what's worthy of dispraise and praise what's worthy of praise. Um, the Buddha also you know, had enemies. Incredible. Even Ajahn Ram does. Or well, Ajahn Ram also does, I should say. He's not more than the Buddha. <laughs> I mean, he certainly does. You know, I, I think we all do. There are people that will um, appreciate us, value us, uh, recognize our qualities. And there are people that will hone in on our faults, which are also there. Um, but I think, again, you know, it's about being honest, isn't it? That, okay, this quality is there in me, but I'm trying. I'm trying to notice it and, yeah, rectify it. Hi, Charles Lee. Can you unmute, please? Oh, thanks. Oh, did Gun Gunther, were you about yeah. to speak? No, no. Oh. I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was thinking about the way you worded, uh, can I think of a time or an example of, of, of not having unwholesome thoughts? Uh, and I thought that was an interesting way to put things versus, I guess I would think, you know, versus having just like wholesome thoughts. I mean, I think like, you know, sometimes I reach for the goal of like, well, I just want to have like wholesome thoughts, but I think, are you saying like there's a, there's like a slight difference, like, and yeah. a way to enjoy the, that, you know, maybe I, 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 you know, I can't get to, you know, just, you know, having, you know, completely wholesome thoughts, but if I can just move a little bit and notice that I don't have unwholesome thoughts, I don't know if you could talk more about the, I feel like that's a, that's a, that's a very fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Distinction um, that I think I get confused with. Right, right. And something that's probably not often noted, you know, it's not really pointed out to us that a lot of the time we're not thinking of killing somebody. We're not thinking of, you know, how to shout at the person in the office when we go in next day. Maybe we're a little bit tense or anxious, but at least we don't have cruel thoughts, you know. And if we can reflect in that way, I think it can really help us on undermine our fault finding mind and our sort of perfectionist mind because we need to learn to think in ways that um that brings gladness to the mind it brings encouragement it's a bit like having a child that you send to school and you know they didn't get an a grade but they didn't make mis many mistakes you know a parent who's just only hones in on the fact that they didn't do brilliantly is not going to you know give that child a lot of confidence and encouragement but maybe we can just say well look you know you didn't fail <laughs> you know you didn't make uh, lots of mistakes you didn't say anything really um unwholesome maybe you haven't found the right words yet but uh you know you're trying you're getting there maybe you didn't say something quite at the right time but you said it with loving kindness 
And um, this is actually a part of what we call sense restraint in the Buddha's teachings. It's part of cultivating wholesome states. So wholesome states aren't only having good qualities, you know, but they can also be just reflecting in ways that bring us encouragement and happiness. So I think that can really cover anything. And like you say, that bit where maybe you're not there, but you're not doing harm. You're doing less harm than you were before. You know, you're getting angry less often or it's lasting for less time. Um, instead of, oh, anger's still there. I've been meditating for 20 years and I still get irritated when I spill carrot juice. And, you know, rather than that, it's like, oh, I also found it kind of fun as well. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't let it spoil my day. So I think that's important. And I think it's skillful use of thought. Um, and this it is called sense restraint in the Buddha's, uh, in the gradual training, but it's a strange word. And I think it'd be better. One of my teachers, Venerable Ujagara, he calls it guarding the senses. I think this is much better because restraint means kind of not looking, not seeing, not, you know, but guarding is almost like you find a way to look, which is more productive of wholesome states. So there's a lot of creativity activity to be had there does that um speak to your question a little bit can you unmute again yes yes oh uh, yeah yeah I, I i like what you said at the end about um uh uh just yeah you know seeing you know kind of seeing experiencing seeing phenomena in, in a in a more helpful yeah in a more helpful way right, right. yeah 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 Good. I think it's really quite liberating when we know we do have a choice, because I think for most of my practice life, it was more about so-called bare awareness, just being aware of what's there and not necessarily noticing how I was aware. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, I think this is a skill that I'm still practicing for sure, but I find it quite creative and, and immediately effective, actually especially if I am dwelling in a whole string of unwholesome, unhelpful thoughts, to just actually say, hey, there's a different way to look at this. Mm. You know? Yeah, Kedwin has her hand up. Can you unmute, please? Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Hi. Um, hi. I, I don't know. I Every time the Buddha talks about irritation I think oh I'm so irritable I'm irritable a lot mm. and I'm irritable about the body and the way the body is not working mm. you know or the body's in pain and um and that um I have uh you know caregivers carers taking care of me and helping me and um you know it, it, things come up you know it's like no the soup didn't you know, it took four hours to make or whatever, you know, and it's like, um, and I also notice like at the same time, because of my practice, I'm able to like feel the irritation and feel joy simultaneously. Like I'm here and my body's hurting and I'm feeling the joy of the Dhamma and hearing you speak. And it's a weird thing. Like they mm -hmm. both coexist with each other and I'm grateful for that. Beautiful. And I guess the question in there is if you have any suggestions about um, lessening the irritation. Mm. And, um, I have ways that I do things, you know, that I try to use skillful means, but I would just love to hear what, you know, what your yeah. thoughts that are. Yeah, it's a big question, really. Um, I mean, you've given a really brilliant, you know, teaching that right there. To say that you can actually find that sometimes you're able to hold that and recognize that there's irritation and also feel uplifted by the Dhamma. So I think in that kind of situation, it's very beautiful because you can bring that delight in the Dhamma to the front of the mind and it almost makes the irritation. It's like, it's like there's a little child having a tantrum somewhere but you're kind of attending to your friend. <laughs> you're talking with your best friend. It's like, it's okay, you can be there under the table, you know, messing about, pulling my hair or whatever. But I'm talking with my best friend now. And so <laughs> you're not completely ignoring them. You're aware of them. 
but you're just not giving them undue attention at this moment in time. And I think that's quite skillful because we do need to balance, you know, working with difficult emotions with bringing up joy and um, reflecting on the on the blessings of our lives. But it depends on how you're feeling at the time. I mean, sometimes it might be possible if you have strong mindfulness to just hold that irritation to be with it as a meditation object and um, extend a bit of kindness towards it. You know, it's okay, you can be here. I can understand why you're here, you know. Most people would feel this way in my situation. I'm actually doing really well. You know, you can give yourself some encouragement like that and you can say, okay, let me see you. Let me just see you. You know, I know you're not my enemy. It's quite natural that you're visiting. I mean, it sounds a bit strange and this. Obviously, you don't necessarily say these things, but it's an attitude that we can have towards those emotions that sort of undermines our impulse to just kick them out. Um, because they're all part and parcel of, you know, the minds we have and our emotional world. And I think we have to learn to uh, to hold them and to to understand them a little bit. And then just to have that, that break from time to time by actually developing wholesome states. You know, you might want to actually practice compassion towards yourself, including towards the irritation. It hurts. It hurts you. It's not a pleasant state. It's a kind of contracted state. So, you know, may I be kind to myself right now? This is really difficult for me. And just practice some compassion. That can really help. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Aya. You're welcome. And be creative, you know. Any one person only can think of a few things that they do, but I think whatever works, and it will be different at different times. Richard, did you want to say something? You want me? Richard, did you try to unmute? He's trying to unmute. Could you send him the message again, maybe, Gunter? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me now? Oh, hi. Yeah, got you. Yeah, sorry about the mob. Um, basically, um, hello, hello. Hello. Uh, so basically, there's a far sort of various different states of, of um, you know, emotional states. Of, you know, um, I, I sort of find myself, it, it, it really depends who I'm with. You know, really does like if I go and visit one friend who I've known for about twenty, about twenty years. You know, I find I'm in one. You know, um, I tend to become Richard in one way with this particular friend, and then if I go to work, you know, like I have to work in you know a certain stadium in London. You know, so then I have to work in a certain stadium in London. Then I become Richard in a different way, you know. Mm -hmm. So I might be stressed in that way, or I might be happy in that way. But I'm com I'm different compared if I'm with this friend that I'm known for twenty yeah. years. Yeah. And then again, if I'm by myself, I'm again. It's, it's almost as if I'm a different sort of Richard. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like I'm sort of conditioned in lots of different ways. Yeah. So can be very um interesting to sort of um see different variations of who Richard is. <laughs> it's very weird. It is Richard is. <laughs> yeah, so it's um it's very um I find it so you know can be quite weird. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's quite quite interesting in the suttas that it doesn't talk about oh is am I like this or am I like that? It actually yeah. just says, do I have this? Do I have that? And it means at this moment, right? Like it's a constant review. It's an investigation that's ongoing, that's looking at ourselves. I mean, obviously not every moment of the day, but actually as mindfulness increases, we can be aware of the state of our mind at various times and we can see it's changing all the time. So I think it's really interesting how it's written, you know, I mean, it does say, do I praise myself and disparage others? But it doesn't say, am I someone who, you know, it's yeah, like, it's, just... it's a, the action it's looking at, it's the behavior that it's looking at and recognizing yeah, that change. Yeah. So I think you know, because, really you know, because, that, you know, I mean, like, for example, if you were sort of with um, Ajahn Brahm yourself, yeah. and just, I presume you are 
in a certain way with Ajahn Brahm, you know. Relax. And that if, you, if you're by yourself, yeah. you know, you're different, perhaps. Yeah, but I mean... I mean so you, get... you can't help it but be this way. Right, in a you, way. If I mean, certain we are conditioned to some extent, yeah. Conditions come up. Mm. So it's just intriguing. It is, isn't it? I mean, certainly there's some people that, you know, we're around that tend to encourage the wholesome qualities in us. And yeah. often it's they do that just by seeing them, mm. you know, just by actually accepting us. They don't even have to say very much. Adrian Brown doesn't praise me. He doesn't disparage me. He's just yeah, sure, of course. cool, whatever, whatever, you know, however yeah. I am, he's cool with it. So in one way you could say I'm different with him, but in the other way it's I'm free to be any anything. Mm. And that's really beautiful because then I'm not identified so much with how I am, you know. But I do think, I mean, if you find that some company frequently or even always, or seems to be always, often, um leaves you agitated, leaves you stressed, leaves you depressed, you know, then sometimes we have to take a bit of distance or at least balance it out with some friends who nourish us and nourish us on the path. Yes. Yeah, because we are conditioned. That's why the Buddha said that spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life, the whole of the spiritual life. You know, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? How can you hear the teachings if you don't come to to listen to them from someone who's giving the teachings or reading the teachings? If we don't have spiritual friends, we can't come in contact with the Dhamma in the first place. So we do need those friends to keep it alive inside us as well. Until we're probably, you know, stream winners. Until we actually understand the Dhamma for ourselves. And then only we're considered to start the training, to have started the training. Right now we're trying to learn how to train. <laughs> Sometimes people say, oh, I still can't meditate. No, none of us can. We're just trying to learn how to meditate. This is all pre-meditation, pre-wisdom. <laughs> you know, we're getting our feet, but we make mistakes. We go this way, we go that way. So we need each other to keep us on track. Okay, um, thank you. You're very welcome. But it's great that you're seeing that, you know, shifting Richard, because, you know, thank after you. a while you realise there's no Richard anyway. It's just thank like you. five candles doing their thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Linda wants to speak. <laughs> Your question, Venerable, reminded me of a very specific thing that happened to me um, at work a while ago um, when I was criticized. And, um, you know, usually when that happened, you know, I would take it in and, you know, do normal, you know, not terribly unskillful things, but there would be an inside like flinch, right? A contraction. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, um, and I remember one very specific time that I was being criticized. And I was, there was no contraction. And I was kind of a little bit incredulous at the time. And it wasn't like I was trying or not trying. It just didn't arise. Yeah. And um, I, I remember it so specifically, but it, cause it wasn't common. Normally there would be that internal mm -hmm. contraction. And you reminded me of that story with your question. And the two things that that um, raise in my mind are one, just how, we can't like practice isn't linear like mm. they like the effects and the impacts they happen as they do and I can't know what she did yeah. the five things I did to make that happen right, right, or, right, right. Um, and also just when you were reading the list at the beginning how much I was reflecting on how much of those responses feel like they're related to non-self like if I didn't feel like I had a self I wouldn't be protecting it in those unskillful ways, That's so right? True. And, That's very true. And, um, yeah. and that one thing that happened to me that time kind of made me just reflect on that because there wasn't that reaction in yeah. that one day, in right? That one moment, uh, yeah. In the one moment, which was very beautiful. And um, it makes yeah. me think of the unwholesome, like not arising in that particular moment. Yeah, so, and noticing it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because sometimes these things can be happening. Like you say, practice is not linear. And if we only count the times it's not working, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but then when you do see, oh, something just shifted there, that wouldn't have happened like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen every day, but mm -hmm. it happens sometimes. And then we notice it. And it's really a relief. And mm -hmm. I think the other reason it says, you know, if we review that we don't have those unwholesome qualities, we can abide happy and glad. 
is because that will encourage it to happen again and again you know it's like saying look mind you know look what happens now this is this is happiness just as we're saying with the other ones look when you have this when you have that this is disagreeing and disagreeable mm -hmm. and displeasing and it causes suffering yeah. but when this happens this doesn't this causes happiness it's like we actually have to tell ourselves like make a mental note and that's part mm -hmm. of the reconditioning but I think it's true you know it's not linear and um, it's never linear and we don't know when the results are going to come in the mm -hmm. practice. So even if, you know, you're on the meta retreat, I don't think anyone was on the meta retreat that didn't benefit. I'm pretty sure we all did because it was a very strong group um, holding field. Um, <laughs> I mean, I benefited and I was teaching, so I'm sure everyone else did. Um, <laughs> it was wonderful for me. I mean, we're all giving each other meta the whole time. So, you know, I think this is why I've now got some good news to share. <laughs> One of the reasons. Um but, uh, you know, even if you don't actually feel the meta on a retreat, the fact that you've been inclining your mind in that direction mm. means that it's going to pop up at some point. It can't not. It's law of nature. You know, you plant a certain seed, it has to give a certain flower. You know, if you plant the meta seed, it's going to give a rose or whatever it's going to give. It's not going to give, you know, um, I think there's actually a sort of that says that. It's not possible if you plant a mango seed to get mm. a, an amalaki, a really, really sour fruit. It's not possible if you plant a sour fruit to get a mango you know the, the, the fruits come according to the seed so I think having some trust in our um in the process not in our ability but in the process of cultivating wholesome states because you weren't doing that before you came to the Dhamma so it can't be worse it's got to be an improvement it just sometimes takes a bit of time to show up so yeah thanks for reminding us of that Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if, if anything um, you would add about the non-self aspect. Yeah, the non-self. Yeah, I know. That's a really mm -hmm. important observation that all the other um, unwholesome qualities, the thing is unwholesome qualities are always based mm -hmm. on a sense of self. And, you know, this is why as a stream winner, when one sees that there is um, no self in there, it's a process of cause and effect. One of the things that happens is a lack of identification with these um unwholesome but even wholesome states we see them as conditioned and we're wiser as to the conditions as well so we don't kind of judge ourselves we don't add anger on anger we don't add mm. you know lording oneself on top of good qualities because you just see it as conditioned it's nothing to do with you mm. and I think as the understanding of non-self grows it really undermines unwholesome mm. states and of course wholesome states increase but there's no pride about that it's just oh this is the Dhamma, you know, this is what happens uh, when these causes are in place. So certainly um, a lot of these states, states like anger, like kind of counter counter reproving, they're very contracted and tight mm -hmm. and they're there to protect a false sense of self. You know, we don't like our false sense of self to be targeted, right? Mm -hmm. If we think we have a self or if we identify with our feelings, then is a problem you know even ill health whatever um anger is a real big problem because this is me and whatever's me must be permanent you know <laughs> but if we can mm. see that this is a phenomena that's mm. passing through like yeah. clouds based on conditions you know bound to pass away as my teacher she always mm. used to say arising just to pass away just to pass away mm. it's like oh yeah it's coming just to pass mm. i don't have to like hold it but that was an experience also because we we're so rooted in actually observing it tangibly that you were seeing it changing while it was there. And it was when you see that and you see it's changing, which is, you know, another aspect of non-self, it's not possible to react because it's changing there and then. It's not like, oh, it will change. I can react until it changes. There's actually nothing there. It's just disintegrating. So that is very a very very helpful practice in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good observation. Sean, you have something to say? Um, can you unmute, please? Um, yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, I I just thought. Well, you said something that brought something up, but uh, before I say that. Um, I was just going to, to say that what's written here, what we've been through, is actually kind of just occurred to me that it's actually really simple. Now, doesn't necessarily. What, sorry? You're a little bit really, 
I said it what well, occurred to me that what we've read through is actually really simple in the yes. okay so it's maybe not that easy to be that mindful can you hear me okay yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. um but if you can ever notice some of these thoughts it all it says is all you need to do is arouse in your mind so to me that's maybe have a thought of you know the opposite and that is enough and yeah just made me think and actually I heard someone and it is you know something that obviously you've mentioned that's in the suttas that you can't have a so-called bad evil thought whilst you've have or unwholesome whilst you have a wholesome one yeah. so it's it's really that simple and I heard someone saying you know that they were in the car they someone told them to do this they were in a car they got angry something happened and they just stopped themselves and they said they said it sounds cheesy but I just said I'm so grateful that I have a car I'm so grateful I'm going home to a nice meal and I'm so grateful that you know whatever else it was yeah and, yeah it's just it's quite sort of liberating to think that actually and they said the anger just dissipated yeah fantastic yeah I completely agree that in theory it's very simple the missing link there is the remembering to be it mm -hmm. well, and that's that where yeah. mindfulness the mm. other meaning of mindfulness that um you know is actually inherent in that word is memory <laughs> and sometimes we just have to remember to do that uh, <laughs> you know because you can be rolling in something for a long time before you remember, okay, I could just see it differently. And um, that's where practice comes in, isn't it? And also this idea that Ajahn Brahm gives of programming on mindfulness, I think it's quite good. Like I think I suggested in the Meta Retreat, you can even start the day by saying, okay, when I meet this person at work, I'll try not to get angry. There's a possibility I'll get angry. You know, watch out for it. Try not to get angry today or try and, you know, consider this person might be having a hard time at home or you know, sometimes we have to like program ourselves to do it. And it's like putting a computer program in that it's more likely than to work when you need it. Um, so, yeah, but you're right. It can be very um, easy in a sense when we remember to do it. Yeah, that's the And whole... also, Sean, it's um, this thing about remembering that we can abide happy and glad oh, yeah. when we do it, isn't it? And train. Yeah, so it's kind of like training. You're, you're you're encouraging, it, you know. But recognize this is the result of training. I must keep training, and if we are happy and glad about it, then that helps us remember. Yeah, yeah. It's the sort of encouraging. So rather than mm. criticizing when you get it wrong, is exactly. actually uh, encouraging when you get it right. Which, yes. There have I mean, been studies on this stuff. If right, you need exactly. progression, that it gets you people far further when they praise or have praise mm. rather than criticize what they do wrong exactly yeah i mean you must know that with your kids too yes yes yeah yeah definitely not not at all the time but <laughs> you notice when you're here even if they're being sort of naughty or playing up a bit if you get a bit short with them or your tone is a bit harsh the behavior gets worse whereas yeah. you could you can calm calm it down and keep it nice and keep it playful, joyful, then it tends to go away. Make yeah, them yeah. something. Yeah. You know. yeah. They need to feel held. I mean, even students, disciples, you know, <laughs> they need that too. That's why we go for teachers that are calm and, you know, even if you get upset, they go, oh, never mind. You'll be okay. I'm not worried about you. And you're like, what? <laughs> you should be and they're like no you know you'll be fine <laughs> just the tone of voice I mean it has to be somebody you trust you know but but uh yeah we just need it's sometimes I think physiological we just need our nervous systems to like calm down a bit you know like even sitting apparently next to someone else who has a well-regulated system it calms you down really quickly if you sit close to someone like that so you know there's all these things that can be shown now that just basically prove what the Buddha said all along. It'll give more detail as to why and how. Yeah, wonderful. Now, just, I'm aware that we have... just quickly add, really quickly, on, yeah. just to say from the retreat, one, two things that happened. First of yeah. all, because we was having, giving metta to, to an indifferent, or what do you call it? Um, uh, stranger love or something. Stranger, yeah. And I saw that person... Uh, and I thought, oh, how lovely to see them. And that was one Aww. thing. And the other thing 
was uh, I just was walking down the road and I just saw someone and I just felt like a load of love for them, like a load oh. of love. And I, I was like, oh, well, I, at first I didn't even notice. So I know that fits in with what we're talking about is was because we did that practice the whole last week. So then it spills over and then that would help with mindfulness when we're talking about this and anything else, I'm sure. Brilliant. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? This is the amazing thing about the demo. Like if you put all those qualities together, it's like they're all layered on top of one another, aren't they? They all feed into each other. Everything. Contentment goes with meta, goes with peace, goes with mindfulness, goes with energy, goes with, you know, the whole thing, doesn't it? Right view. It's amazing. They're all sort of just different aspects of one beautiful dhamma, in a sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, Sean. That's really great. <laughs> I haven't met my stranger yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. If it's okay with the group, I might um continue because the, the next we've only done one paragraph, which is totally fine. Um, but the next one would actually round things off and um show us what to do when. I think it's probably just an extension, but a little bit more, a little bit more, a nice analogy at the end. So we're in the process of reviewing, reviewing ourselves, aren't we? So um, we can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome qualities if we do not have these things. And then it goes through all of them, praising oneself and disparaging others, adhering to views and relinquishing them with difficulty. When we know that I adhere to my own views and relinquish them with difficulty, then we should make an effort to abandon these evil unwholesome qualities. But when we know I do not adhere to my own views, hold on to them tenaciously and relinquish them with difficulty, then we can abide happy and glad, even if a little bit, training day and night in wholesome qualities. So the next one is a little bit more instruction. Friends, when a person reviews themselves thus, if they see that these, I'm going to say bad, unwholesome qualities are not all abandoned in themselves, they should make an effort to abandon them all. It's amazing, isn't it? Because that just shows me that it's possible, you know? But if, when we review ourselves thus, we see that they are all abandoned, then we can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome qualities. And then there's a lovely simile. Just as when a young woman fond of adornments, and there are young women fond of adornments, I have to think of my niece who's just asked at the age of 12 for moisturizer. Face, she wanted face care. Well, she wanted a, a, like a face care pack for Christmas at 12. Anyway, it's kind of, my mom said no. <laughs> She's her granddaughter, right? She said, no, I'll get you something else. Anyway. <laughs> Just as when a young woman fond of ornaments on viewing the image of her own face in a clear bright mirror or in a basin of clear water sees a smudge or a blemish on it, she makes an effort to remove it. But if she sees no smudge or blemish on it, she becomes glad. It is a gain for me that it's clean. Like when you look at your teeth and there's no bits, and you're like, oh, phew. Mm. <laughs> I've been a gross nor. Anyway. It is a gain for me that it is clean. So too, when someone reviews themselves thus, uh, that, they're, that they're all abandoned, I wish they wouldn't do the dot, dot, dot sometimes. When a monk refused thus, and they see that they're all abandoned in themselves, then they can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome qualities. So. So in a sense, that speaks to what Sean said, that it's quite easy, really, if you do look in that mirror. But sometimes we don't look in that mirror. We look somewhere else. It's a lovely analogy, actually, because, you know, it's holding up a mirror, literally, to ourselves. And part of that holding up a mirror is being able to accept feedback. Because sometimes we can't see everything, right, in the mirror. Sometimes another person is our mirror. But often we just look outside and try to fix the world and, you know, fine if you're also doing your inner work. And that's the important thing. And that's where activism can kind of burn us out because we're trying to fix the world. And in the meantime, we might not be looking in the mirror. The dirt might be accumulating. The exhaustion might be accumulating. And, you know, we don't know until it's too late. And uh, that goes for me as well sometimes. 
Um, actually, I can know very well that I'm tired. <laughs> Someone said I shouldn't be here tonight, but I want to be, you know, because I can still actually do this. And it's lovely to meet you all and <laughs> all the rest. But we have to be very careful that we don't um, forget to look in that mirror and make sure the unwholesome qualities aren't accumulating. Right. I guess sometimes you can look in the mirror and see the smudge and think, OK, I'll do it in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah it can be that easy if we just remember and then we have to realize i like this as well we become glad thus it is a gain for me that it is clean it reminds me of the the three monks that live together and they used to say it is a gain for me it's a great gain that i'm living with such virtuous companions in the holy life i do that every day here i have to say not that you're all monks and nuns or whatever but you can't be monks because they're all yeah. female at the moment but uh you know it's like oh it's so lovely to be with everybody it's so lovely to be with spiritual friends and then i feel happy if i was just like taking it for granted it would be yeah almost irrelevant wouldn't it it would still affect me but I wouldn't actually notice or wouldn't actually have the cause to celebrate. So I think it's it's really wonderful that we notice, okay, it's clean. And it's a gain for me that it's clean. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, bringing up this idea of rejoicing in what is absent, yeah? Rejoicing in the cleanliness. It doesn't have to be with makeup or with something beautiful, but it's just clean. Very nice. Liz has her hand up. Yeah, Liz, can you unmute? I think it will probably be the last question for today, actually, or comment. Hello. Hi. Um, right, hello from France. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat. Uh, you know me, I, I have this question about holding on to views. I do hold on to views, like poverty, it's unfair, and I'll do whatever I can to... Um, to prevent it, or at least to help people who are in the situation. I'm against wars, and I'll do whatever I can to prevent that happening. Views are not an academic exercise or just being pig-headed. There are things which are very serious, and I think us as, as Buddhists with an ethical mindset that there are things we have to oppose. Uh, and, you know, holding on to views, I, I'm not going to sort of move with the wind when I see sexual abuse, when I see poverty, when I see exploitation, when I see modern time slavery. I'm not just going to sit on my hands saying, I'll meditate. Good, good. Mm. Thank you. So, I, I mean... What is the view of that? Am yeah. I the only one to say, yes, I am holding on to yeah. my views? Yeah, yeah. I think in this case, we have to remember this is talking about things that make us difficult to live with, things that lead to displeasing our fellow monastics in a monastery, things that make them as a person not to be trusted, right? This is the preamble to the whole thing. Um, these are the things that make us difficult to correct, yeah, so it's those kind of views that make us untrustworthy, difficult to correct, basically quite arrogant, not able to receive feedback. So it's when we're actually not able to um, take the instruction of the Buddha, receive the teaching. This is the problem. I think the kind of things that you're speaking about, I, I don't know, you could call them views, but I would say they're more, um, they're more based on wisdom. They're more like seeing suffering and trying to resolve it. And if there are views in there, such as it is not fair, asking yourself if that's a helpful view. I mean, maybe it's not fair. The fact is it's there. So I think anything that is actually helping you to accept a situation and then find a, a, a valuable and a effective solution is a helpful view. But if it's a view that's causing you a lot of suffering and that's causing you diff to be difficult to live with, difficult to correct, et cetera, et cetera. It's those kind of views that we're talking about. So really in this context of the suttas, it's probably speaking about wrong view in terms of, you know, kind of not really understanding the unwholesome as unwholesome, 
and thinking that it's good to go about lying and to, you know, it's it's really talking about very bad behavior that would prevent one from seeing the Dhamma. So the things that you're talking about are great, but again, you know, there can also be a lot of emotion there that is maybe causing you extra suffering that you may think is a motivation to, to act, but sometimes it can just drain you and you might be able to act even without those views. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does, because it has in the past many times. I mean, uh, I've been, uh, you're going to laugh, but I've been an activist since I was about 13 years old. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm not going to laugh. Uh, I'm going to go, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I'm not friends of nothing, you know. Uh, That's wonderful. <laughs> although I did live yes. many, most of my life abroad, mainly in the UK, but not only. Mm. Um uh, I yes, but sometimes it actually did make life extremely difficult, yeah. and I wouldn't have minded if it has produced results. But in fact, I damaged myself in the process. Yeah. Rather than, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. there you go. You live and learn. Uh, yes. But and now is not the end, right? Now is not the end. You maybe have harmed yourself in the past, but maybe now you can reflect on all the beautiful things you've actually done and on the lovely intentions that you had, and you can actually bring some happiness up for all those wonderful things you've done. Well, do you know, I do. I yeah. do. Uh, I mean, I, I've had quite bad news recently, yeah. uh, not nice. And I, I'm thinking, well, Yes, but you know, when you consider all I've done, you know, for various charities and even in my job, do you know what? I haven't done too badly, actually. Right. But it no. opens the door, you see, because, well, I, I told you, but people might not remember, you know, that I work for a charity for uh, to feed people. And... Uh, yeah, this morning, there was somebody who was really, I was starting to get irritated. And then I looked at her and I thought, yeah, but just think, this woman is here giving her time for nothing and doing the best she can with what she is and what she knows. How can you feel irritated with somebody like that? Mm. And do you know, I, I looked at her and I said, do you know what, let's go and have a coffee. And uh, that uh, took the tension down, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I, I think we do tend, well, I do tend to criticize myself uh, quite vigorously at times. Mm -hmm. But remembering what we've done and looking at other people with another pair of glasses, you know, Yes, it can be irritating and so on, but but I mean, in my case, yes, she's here uh, at eight o'clock. I was there at seven. It was raining. It was cold. And she wasn't obliged to. She doesn't get a penny for it, neither do I. And I, I looked at her and I actually felt quite a lot, a lot of, of loss for her. I yeah. thought, yeah. Good. Uh, Wonderful. It, it, it's important to, yeah. and I think it diffuses anger and irritation in me yeah. when I look at the quality uh, that are displayed in front of me, mm -hmm. because there are very few people I can't find qualities in. Sometimes it takes a while, but yeah, most people have got uh, yeah. very good sides if you look. Sometimes with a microscope, but get the microscope out, you'll find something. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you for that. Yeah. I like that analogy of, you know, putting on a different pair of glasses. It's like literally, you know, you can play like that with perception. You can say, right, today, instead of putting on my irritated glasses, I'll pick up my accepting glasses or my patient glasses. And yeah. yeah it, but, but I'm going mean, to have to stop you, though, because we're nearly out of time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. But it's a lovely place to end. And um, yeah, Manori wanted to say a few words. And I also wanted to say, first of all, to share my news, actually, before she speaks. Um, I don't know how many people don't know about the fact that we were putting an offer on a property. Does anyone not know? You all can't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written anything anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's bizarre. Well, we did put an offer on a property during that meta retreat, which was rather a beautifully auspicious time to do it. Um, mm -hmm. As I say, I was being carried in a field of meta and um, there was an awful lot of goodwill. Actually, there's a wonderful lot of goodwill. It's a funny language sometimes. And uh, <laughs> and we put the offer in on, we put our next offer in on Friday because he wasn't happy with the first. And I thought, nah, we haven't got it, you know, because it's way below what he was sort of hinting at. Um, but we gave everything we had. We basically emptied our accounts. Plus we had to take a huge loan as well from people we trust. But anyway, and then uh, I got back after the meta retreat and that very same day, I got an email saying our offer was being considered. It was still having conditions on it. Like we had to speak to the owners and we had to agree not to negotiate if they found something on the survey and blah, blah. And we, I said, well, what about that? That sounds a bit strange. I asked Ajahn Brown and we just said, look, there's so much momentum. There's so many people want this to happen. If there's problems with it in one way or another, we'll figure it out together. And so we met with the one of the owners and uh, he was, seemed a bit nervous, but eventually he sort of said a few encouraging words like, can non-Buddhists come? And we're just going to be now a, a mile down the road. So, you know, <laughs> no, maybe the community is going to warm up to you when they get used to you. And he said a few things like that. And at the end he said, well, you won out. Oh. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I sort of, wrote back to them I said well you know is this official like are we going to get the um the kind of uh are you going to like it's still on the market and everything oh yeah no it won't take long we're just trying to discuss with the agent how to change that and now it says sold subject to terms and conditions in fact I can't even find it now mm -hmm. and uh yes we've put in an offer and it's been accepted we went out over the other three offers that two of which were cash offers but somehow our efficiency, and I have to congratulate Minori, who's right by, by me. She's our new treasurer. And Elena, who have been working on this day and night, um, including me as well, but not as much as them, I guess. And they've been brilliant. And I really don't think without these new trustees, we'd have had a hope. So um, it's just wonderful. And everything just keeps coming on, you know. And of course, it's not the end and we still need your help and we need your involvement, you know, and I'm hoping that you'll find it a place that you will enjoy coming to visit. And uh, <laughs> of course, before we do a full on celebration, I want to actually get the contracts exchanged. But um, that should be happening at the end of January because they really want us to move fast. So as I say, our trustees are fast. Everything's going well. We've got the loan in our bank account already. <laughs> <laughs> nothing can stop us now <laughs> some of the songs say so I'm going to uh, leave you to rejoice <laughs> and um, I'm going to hand over to Manoi who's here now so do give her a round of applause as well if you can yeah. <laughs> and Elena as well so so that is not the end it is a start so with a lot of and now the work begins so that was a background work Elena and I are doing but then we need the whole community to do the rest of the work. And at the moment, there's like so many costs that we are trying to do, the surveys and, uh, um, you know, lawyers fees, you know, about the, the private house sales. So when it is a charity and a company, it, it's much more than that. Um, and uh, so that is where, uh, I mean, not only few of us, but this is for the wider community who's listening in, in the YouTube as well. So that is where um, we want your donations to come now. And so we'll be all part of this big project. And uh, so this is an opportunity. I would look at it as that. This is an opportunity for us to get involved in this and the change in this history of, you know, making a proper Vihara uh, which, you know, the nuns can train, we can go and meet, and uh, it'll be there for generations. It is mm -hmm. big enough property that slowly we can develop. So that is uh, the immediate um, uh, needs. And then after that, you know, then we move, and then there'll be so many other things like um, um, purchasing things, um, you know, the maybe white goods, maybe... Um, other things that the monastics need that will fit into that house. And then also, um, once we go there only, we will know what is what we have to replace um, 
is the boiler working properly? Do we have to change things? That that sorts of things. So, and then, uh, as you know, we are, uh, at the moment, the Vihara is in a sm small semi-detached house in uh, Oxford, but that property is much larger. So that means the monthly bills will be larger as well. So if you are able to um, do any um, standing orders, um, so so like, you know, every month there'll be a minimum amount coming in to run the monastery, that would be gratefully received. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody for being part of this. It's absolutely incredible. Our hearts are so warm. Even if we hadn't got the thing, our hearts would have been incredibly warm. Just by all your encouragement and support, it's amazing. I'm really on a bit of a cloud at the moment, which is why I can be sick and it doesn't bother me because uh, it's sort of surreal, you know, it's sort of it's bigger than any of us. It's kind of the product of thousands of millions of trillions of intentions over many, many years. And all the people that have gone before and all the bhikkhunis and all the bhikkhus and all the the Buddha really <laughs> wanted this to happen. So here it is. <laughs>